Um, so yeah, so so thanks a million. Um, so yeah, basically this is uh, just a look, look, looking at the traditional farm building scheme. Um, Anna is from the Heritage Council and she'll just let you know how it works, how you apply for grants, what buildings um, are suitable. Um, and then I'll talk about, I'm an ecologist. Uh, I see I'm on this as Brian Keeley, but that's actually my husband. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, Donna Mullen and I work with Wildlife Surveys Ireland and I, um, I do bat surveys. So I'll give a little talk about bats. We find lots of rare bats in, the, in these buildings. And then I'll put you on to uh, Jonathan. And um, Jonathan actually has a farm and I worked for him last year and uh, he'll tell you the good, the bad and the ugly and how it all works in practice. So um, just to, to kick things off, I'll hand you over to Anna. Thanks very much everyone for coming along and um, uh, put any questions in the chat. Thank you. Thanks Donna. Hi everybody. I talk about particular aspects of the scheme in terms of landscape and skills and different things like that. I think the best person to talk about the experiencing of the scheme will be Jonathan because he did receive a grant last year, but I'll be happy to ask answer any particular questions you have that might crop up over the course of my or Jonathan's talk or even Donna's. And I hope you don't mind, I'm going to read from my notes because if I don't, I'll go completely off on a tangent and uh, that won't be good for anybody. So I'm gonna start trying to share my screen now. Maybe that this works. And if I can just move over to slideshow. Yeah, is that okay, everybody? Yeah, great stuff. Okay, so I do work for the Heritage Council. For those who don't know us, we're a public body established in 1995 under the Heritage Act. We marked 25 years in existence last year. Our mission is to develop a wide understanding of the vital contribution that our heritage makes to our societal, economic and environmental well-being. Uh, we manage a lot of different programs. Probably some of our best known ones are Heritage in Schools, Heritage Week, the Irish Wall Towns Network, Historic Towns Initiative, the Museum Standards Programme of Ireland, the Heritage Officer Network, there's also numerous others. But we're probably particularly well known for our grant schemes, of which we have a number open at the moment. The Irish Wall Towns Network has their grant scheme open. Also our Community Heritage Grant Scheme, which may be of interest to some, that closes on Monday. But the one I'll talk about today is the Gloss Traditional Farm Buildings Grant Scheme. And that's open at the moment. Uh, it's an online application and it will close on the 5th of April. We could, oh, sorry, I better go back there, sorry. This grant scheme in particular had a novel starting point. To begin with, it's funding sources in an agricultural measure to protect the environment. Um, it's funded by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we work with a lot of other partners to achieve our aims for heritage, and we couldn't do this scheme without the Department of Agriculture. The recognition that these buildings as being worthy of support in the environmental protection context is considered groundbreaking. The grant scheme was conceived of and valorized as a contribution to the conservation of the Irish rural landscape character through their repair. Landscape painting in Ireland often chooses as its theme the subsistence dwelling set in the picturesque surroundings that sustain a mode of life. I suppose in Ireland, vernacular built heritage is practically synonymous with thatched roofed houses or cottages. They play a central role in the symbolic self understanding of ourselves as rural, self sufficient, and resourceful. However, this image has come under threat as a result of the forces of cultural modernization, particularly obviously in the latter half of the last century, and represents an ideal rather than a lived reality. And our principal concern is if the image of the vernacular is fossilized, it will be seen to have disappeared. And this is one of the reasons why we are so particular and concerned about this scheme. In our view, the vernacular built heritage in this image is not just the house, but also the outbuilding to the left-hand side and the landscape features such as the stone walls. And it's the public value of the landscape that continues to justify the funding for this scheme. That's a vital aspect of it. If we think we support a lot of vernacular buildings on the scheme and vernacular built heritage in particular is connected to its immediate context and landscape, the building doesn't exist in isolation, it's created from its surroundings, the distinctive stone of the walls, the slate of the roof. 
This is a building just a few miles uh, from the Cage of Fields in North Mayo that we supported. The scheme is aimed at getting farmers to put a cultural value on their buildings, which may otherwise be neglected. And as part of the application process, the owner must make a statement of what they see as the heritage value of the building. And just to note that there's a hill there just cropped off to the left of the photo. It's known locally as Slate Hill, but it's not named on any map. It was told to us by the farmer when informing us of its cultural value. So that knowledge that you won't find anywhere apart from what a person holds in their memory. The emphasis in particular on the scheme is on the process rather than maybe stylistic or aesthetic results, what we call intangible heritage in traditional building skills. And when we set out the details aims of the scheme, we set out to encourage owners of the building to carry out their own repairs if they wish to do that. We do allow for that in the costings on an application. I suppose farmers have always tended to be resourceful and practical and hands-on and adept to using materials to hand. And also the farm buildings are not for human habitation. So this gives us scope for experimenting with traditional building techniques, as in a sense, the stakes are lower. One of our ambitions on the scheme is that we can use materials gathered local from the locality as far as possible in the repair of the buildings. So it's both sustainable and affordable. This is a project in County Leitrim, which we supported. The farmer whose hands you see there wanted to carry out all the repairs himself. So he arranged for analysis of that existing mortar. And this was carried out and it indicated that it was comprised of a sandy soil mixed with quicklime. Now that in itself isn't unusual, but also what was good is that he did his own tests. So he dug on his own land just behind that building there, also on a neighbor's land one mile up that road and then a few miles further afield. And the difference in the three samples was quite something, but that used with the soil from his own land was the closest match. And in this case here, this is the daughter of a Mayo farming couple and she carried out all the mortar repairs. This is her in the, her workshop. And her workshop is the original dwelling on site. This was her grandfather's house. So it's lovely that it still has a life within that farm. She's never done this before. And she is, so she had hoped to get the mortar analyzed, but there was quite a long waiting time. So she decided to try and match it up for herself as closely as possible. So this is an example of one of her mixes. Colour is too orange when compared to the original mortar. Similar setting properties to mortar mix six, soft and setting rate slow, easy to apply, not sandy looking enough compared to original mortar mix. The collection of sample proved to be quite difficult and it was very overgrown and only visible in two locations. The colour is too strong of an orange. There's also not enough aggregates showing through the mortar. Next sample, mix sand with granddad sand to increase aggregates. Keep line content high to try and encourage a better setting rate. Now we don't get many method statements with granddad sand being referenced. You can see here she made a huge effort in trying to match the mortar. This is her table. She came up with this herself. It's something we encouraged, but we certainly didn't insist on it, of her 25 mortar mixes that she tried. And she eventually went with mortar mix 24. And what I have to say is that she's never worked with mortar before but she does have a background in environmental science. And I remember she told me that she had worked in a lab for a short time, but didn't like it because it was so results driven, whereas this gave her the chance in terms of experimenting. And I will say all this, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. This matching up is done by sight, but it's not for beauty. It's the enduring quality of the materials as testified by their presence in the old building. That's really what matters to us. In this case, this, pro this project was carried out by a, a very experienced stonemason. So thanks to his knowledge of and expertise in mortar, he could analyze it himself and the replacement mortar designed on site. So you can see samples were crushed and mixed with clear water. That's there on the left. So the sediments helped to determine the amounts of each of the components. And what he discovered in his mortar were small amounts of anthracite. And that's not surprising because this is actually a coal mining area here. 
And that was presumably added due to its availability and also because it's believed to have strength enhancing properties. Oops, I'm going backwards. And this is now a very another skilled stonemason, Pat Hickey, with the architect Michael Tierney up on a scaffold on a project in County Wexford. And we know this is Wexford because that's a glass slack and slate roof. I'd know that anywhere and you only get that in a particular part of the country. And it means that it's probably a stonemason is the best person to repair that type of slate. The overall ethos on the scheme is, sh should be about sharing experience and technique and passing on of skills. We ask that a conservation consultant be engaged to oversee works, but our best projects have always been partnerships of respect between consultant, craftsperson and owner. It's not that you must follow the instructions set out in the specification, which is, I suppose, the approach in many formal building contracts, but it's more a kind of, here's how you do this, or this is what I've tried, or what do you think about this kind of approach? We think this approach strengthens the relationship between people and their buildings. This is a traditional farm building in County Donegal, which we refunded the repair of. Now, this is 10 years ago that we funded this, but I always, always mention it. It's an exemplary project in terms of the challenge of low key repair and also an excellent partnership between consultant, builder and owner. That slate roof covering is a stone slate. It's a flag, it's a flag roof covering known locally as Roisin. And it's a slate distinctive to only a very few square miles of its locality. And whilst the buildings are modest, they help represent the very special character of this area. We don't have any particular stone working quarries in Ireland at the moment. All our slate is imported or sourced secondhand in some way. But in this instance, it was possible to quarry slate directly from an existing scene to the rear of the garden of the house. I suppose that whole idea of the land bearing fruit, you really couldn't get any more local or more vernacular than that. These, those type of slates, they're originally fixed with wooden pegs embedded in lime mortar. So the builder here, he tried a variety of material and making up new pegs. The local bog timber on the left produced a virtually identical result to the original. And additionally, with bog oak, the ends play slightly when hammered home, and this helps to keep the pegs in place. And that's it on completion. And this, what's interesting is that the same consultant and builder here, in terms of the experience that they gained, have carried out repairs on a number of similar, um, both outbuildings and houses with that covering in the locality. We also have the flexibility, I suppose, to ignore supposed good practice. For example, the use of a felt underlay under slate we don't allow it for a number of reasons. One being that the breathable version is considered deathly harmful to bats. And Donna might speak about that. And we want to protect bats and birds as much as buildings on this scheme. We're a heritage body, all heritage matters to us. We can have influence in this way, but it's always a two way conversation. The builder here had come across lime parging in the 1960s, but had not used it since. And he has worked on a number of farm building projects where his skill in applying lime parging has continued to develop. And note those, that photograph on the left, they're washed cow tails. Parging, in order for parging to stick, you need a fiber component. And the cow tails are the fiber in, in, let's say the original parting, you can certainly use other materials as well but cow tails are both free and a local material, although it is a bit annoying for the cows, to be honest. And another, I suppose, very important reason why we do support something like parging is that we want to support traditional skills on the scheme, including the wet trades. We have another initiative that we manage called the Traditional Building Skills Initiative. There's an estimated 170. 5,000 buildings in Ireland constructed before 1919, 
we need people who can repair those buildings. We don't build like that anymore. So it's vital that those, these trades and these crafts remain living trades. So for example, if someone can apply lime parging to the underside of slates, they can also apply lime render to walls and vice versa. Also, because uh, we can support landscape features now, such as wrought iron wheel gates, the skill of the blacksmith is something that we can support, in particular, the skill of the traditional back blacksmith in terms of forging. We've made a film, uh, we've made a number of films, although they're not released yet, apart from one, which just went up on our YouTube channel last week. And it features a project which was supported under both our traditional building skills initiative, the traditional farm buildings grant scheme, and it was done with the traditional trades network of Ireland. And it features the repair of wrought iron field gates that we repaired as part of a project in County Clare la uh, last year. We feel in, with, in terms of heritage, heritage that communication on heritage is key. That's what we do and how we communicate is vital. And we find that with particular on this scheme that verbal communication is probably best, one-to-one -one or one-to-few communications in terms of the ethos of the grant, what is expected of owners, what is expected of builders, but also what is expected of ourselves, that the conservation ethos is taken on. We do also have guidance and we make that available, but that does tend to be secondary than actually those phone conversations or site visit inspections. And the works are carried out in the farmyard. So the farmer is at the very least a witness to the process but in the majority of projects, to be honest, much more actively involved. We're also very keen in terms of creating public awareness of heritage. And we do ask for that as part of the condition of the grant. So many farmers have held open days on their farms. And this has been a very useful thing because it helps to ensure that the widest possible section of the farming community is reached beyond the project. I think as a heritage body, we simply would not have that same reach on their own in terms of reaching the farming community. The open days are held in, uh, in the buildings that we are supporting, and so they tend to serve as exemplar for others. We've also organised training days and partnerships with other organisations, such as the Building Lands Forum of Ireland and also the Society for Protection of Aging Buildings. Also, um, up in the top right there, we did a training day with uh, Carlo Institute of Technology, their architectural technology students. It's never just one single profession. We always insist on training and conservation being carried out between the craftsperson and the specifier so that there's no monopoly on expertise. That matters a lot to us. Another form of training is on-site training whereby an experienced builder can act as a mentor to the owner's builder if they're not particularly experienced with traditional materials for a short period, and this is grant eligible. We do not insist on heritage contractors on the scheme. It's generally preferable that the builder who's always worked on the buildings and who will obviously also be continuing to work on the buildings long after the grant is complete does carry out the grant dated works. And the farmer uh, up was upscaled by the builder shown in the previous photograph. The farmer did the works here to the front in terms of the pointing. He was able to exploit a fallow time in his farming calendar. And that was quite a good thing to do, I think here, because he has quite uh, a number of buildings on this farm that he has now benefited from his experience of. And a very nice of type of upskilling is where we've got someone like an experienced family member. In this case, a project in County Monaghan, the father is a retired building contractor. The son was the gloss farmer. So there was a lot of <laughs> to and fro and shared experience on that project. And you can see as well as that, we support patchy. Patchy is fine. We don't do works unless there's necessary. We leave things um, as they are if they don't need to be done. And what's worked in particularly well this year, um, this past year, is the use of case studies. We've updated a lot in terms of all our different grant schemes, in terms of featuring projects which have been supported. Um, and they provide a particular help. 
uh, the photographs of the different repairs of, on the website of this Kerry project served as a template for this project in Tipperary, where the builder only previously had experience in, of putting up modern concrete sheds. And every, for the last three years, apart from last year, we have a gathering um, for shortlisted applicants in the Midlands, as it's a nationwide scheme, that's important. And it's important that we gather as many as possible together, not just the shortlisted applicants, but we also ask that they invite their planners, their conservation consultants, their builders, and the ecologist, so that all can gather in the one space. It's quite a, it's quite a, a special gathering. We feel on this scheme that by connecting the owner with the buildings in this way, we hope then chooses their chances of being cared for and lasting into the future and also maintain the vitality of the rural landscape. A living, vital landscape is what matters to us and that those buildings are used and serve as, and serve as such a positive contribution, not just in terms of wildlife and skills, but also the beauty that they add to the landscape. That's it for me on this. I hope I, I, I know that was a bit of a sail through. So I'm happy to answer any questions at the end, but I'm going to hand over to Donna. Now, Donna is a long standing member of the Heritage Council Wildlife Committee. She was also a, a Farming for Nature ambassador in April 2019, member of Bath Conservation Ireland, has done a number of wildlife surveys on the scheme, and is a complete, I think, ambassador for Bath as well as badgers, if I remember, John. <laughs> okay, thanks, Donna. I'll move now. Uh, thank, thanks oh, very much. I have to stop sharing you, sorry. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anna. That's, uh, that, that was very interesting. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen now. Um, no, I'd just... Hopefully, hopefully you'll all be able to see that. I know some people weren't able to see Anna's one. Um, uh, so hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to see that. I'm going to talk about bats and traditional farm buildings. And um, in a lot of these farm buildings, there are bats and I, I uh, often do surveys on them. So I'm just going to take you through the bats that I tend to find in these buildings and tell you a little bit about them. And um, I always think it's kind of interesting to, to know um, kind of how the bats think and what, you know, I never like these books that tell you a bat is whatever, so many centimetres and a wingspan of whatever. I like to try and get into the head of a bat and try and, try and imagine what, what would the world look like if I was that species. So, um, so I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll just talk a, a bit about them and then tell you about uh, what happens when you find them in your building. Um, so we just start off with our most beautiful bat, possibly. Oh, there, there we are. And um, that's a brown long-eared bat. Um, and it's it's a very shy bat. It's very quiet. It, it doesn't, it, it feeds by eating things from the ground. So you see it's got very big eyes. And um, so it kind of, it, it kind of uh, flutters around. It doesn't have very strong ultrasound and it uh, gleans food. So it kind of sneaks up on moths that are whatever, resting on bushes and uh, uh, butterflies and things like that. And it, and it eats them. Um, they call it the Catholic bat because it loves Catholic churches with those big roofs, the big roof spaces. Um, and actually a lot of barns have those big empty roof spaces as well. And, and often, often the farmer's house has a big empty roof space as well. And they're, they're terribly conservative. The females only ever travel about a mile and a half away from the roost. They never go further than that. And the males might go two and a half, uh, actually, sorry, not a mile and a half, a kilometre and a half. Uh, the males go two and a half kilometres. So it's very short distance that they travel and they're very faithful to their site. They come back year after year. Um, uh, so if, if ever, whenever you get an injured one of these in, it's very important that that bat goes back to its site because if you put it even three kilometres away, it'll be completely lost. So it's, um, they're, they're very shy. And if you put up a bat box, there's been studies done recently, and it can take up to four years for a, a, a bat, to even, a, a brown on your bat, to even look at a new bat box or think about moving in. Whereas like with the pipistrelle, I've put up bat boxes and I've had them try to go in as I actually was hanging up the bat box. So some bats will really take to change and this one won't, it, you know, it really, so farm buildings and whatever it roosts is, it, it's very important for it. Um, because it really doesn't like change, this bat. 
Um, so just a little bit about the bat and how they spend their year. They're, they're kind of looking for two different roost types. In the summertime, the females get together and they form a maternity roost. And then the females, they're all, they all kind of crush together to get warm. Heat is really crucial to bats. They need a temperature of 30 degrees. And you can really tell if you go and you stick your head up into an attic and the heat hits you, you'll know that that's, what, you know, that's suitable for bats. Um, so like 30 degrees Celsius is, is very, very hot. Um, and they, they, it, bats usually only have one young every year, every two years. So like people often think, oh, they look like mice. I'll have one this year and I'll have 20,000 of them next year. But actually that isn't the way. Um, and and it really that's why they're so endangered because they're just so slow to reproduce and any disturbance to their roost can be just catastrophic. Um, so from May to August, the, young, the mothers go, they're pregnant, they have their young. And then in August, the young start flying. Well, actually, usually, usually it's about um, the end of July. You see the bats out and they're just extremely wobbly. You'll see them flutter all around the place. Um, and they have to, they learn how to fly and they, they, they often crash at this stage or they make a mistake and they fly into an open window of a house. And if that ever happens, just put them on an upstairs windowsill and they'll fly away again or their mother will come and pick them up. Um, so kind of usually the last week of July, first week of August, I'm getting loads of calls from people saying, a bat has come into my house and it's just a baby that has gotten lost. So they're very wobbly the first uh, two weeks or so. But by, um, by September, they start moving out. And um, for the winter time, they want something really the opposite of, uh, of that hot space. They want somewhere cool, about seven degrees. Some like underground spaces, um, some like the traditional farm buildings are just ideal because it's like it's no good being in somebody's house because you'll have it heated and it'll be far too hot for a bat to live in. They might live in crevices and trees. And so, uh, so, so basically they, they look for quite a range of temperatures and in a lot of these farm buildings that's what they can get and also there's very little disturbance in these buildings. So just to take you through some of the other bats, bat species. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, could you put that on to full presentation mode just because the pictures are wonderful, but it's a little bit small. Sure. Um, I just figure out how to do yeah. that. <laughs> Down the bottom next to the bar that shows the percent, there's a the, the button closest to it. Down the bottom. Yeah. The very bottom of oh. your screen. Yeah. There's a the button right next to that bar. It's just to the left. Ah, here we go. No, the other side. No. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. This, yeah. Yeah, that excellent. Excellent. There we are. Lovely. Thank you. Great. So this is the this is the common pipa shell. Um, it's got a little black face, and um, for some reason, for years we we thought that all the pipa shells were the same because they really they all look very similar. So there's a common pipa shell, the soprano pipa shell, and the nathusias pipa shell, and the common pipa shell and soprano pipa shell really look very similar. Um, the soprano pipistrelle can have a bit of a, a paler face. Um, but even now, I, like I get sick bats in all the time over the summer. And often you get one in and you think, oh, you know, this is a common pipistrelle. And it's only when I put on my bat detector can I tell the difference. Um, the common pipistrelle echolocates at 45 uh, kilohertz, and the soprano pipistrelle echolocates at 55 kilohertz. And we use a bat detector, converts to ultrasound down into uh, a signal you can read on the computer. And you can see easily then um, what species you have. It's quite easy to tell the pipistrelles apart from this, from this. Now, I'm not entirely sure what I do next to change. Ah, hey, here we go. Um, this is the Nathusias pipistrelle. Um, the Nathusias pipistrelle, I don't know how we mixed it up with the others for years, because it's really totally different. It's really furry. And it's a bit bigger than our other pipistrelles, and it's very, very brave. It'll go out in all kinds of wild, windy weather. And um, they also commute very long distances. I, I have a friend who works at the local farmer's market. He's French, and he was ringing birds, and he caught an enthusiast pipistrelle in a nest while he was ringing the birds. And um, he looked at, had a band on its leg, and when he had a, on its wing, when he had a look at it, it had come uh, from, from Lithuania. So that is just a huge distance for, uh, an animal that size. Now, the very peculiar thing about the Nathusias pipistrelle, uh, they seem to take Brexit very seriously. The females won't come across the border. 
So the males are up there, whatever, uh, and have the, the, the females have they have maternity roosts up there. But in uh, the Republic of Ireland and in, in the South, there's only one uh, Natusi's Pipistrelle roost. It's in Wexford. Um, and it's it's very peculiar. And yet you get the males all the time calling, but we just don't get females. The thing is that if we are ever going to get females, and the Pipistrelle, they really like to have a to, to sing loud and have a, a really, you know, a, a good shout, especially the males when they're calling for females. And um, they love in, they love being in a farm courtyard because you know you kind of get that echo chamber effect of the noise all bouncing from walls. So I think if we're ever going to find a female Nathusi's people Australian, a roost of them, a paternity roost, we find them in doing traditional farm building surveys because we find them in that setup. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of it's a bit kind of sad and lonely. The poor Hills Pippa's Jones. I've one in my backyard at the moment, singing his little heart out, but uh, but no joy. Can't get the females over. This is a the ultrasound of common Pippa's Jones. And so basically, this is what I do when I do a bat survey. I go out, and I set recorders up all over the place, and um, then I I play them back, because when you're looking at the bats and you, you can hear them all right, but running the the um, sound to the computer is wonderful. And um, you see, there's a little kind of a, the common shell has kind of an L shape and where the L is, is at 45 kilohertz. So that tells you it's a common pipistrelle. shell. The soprano pipistrelle, shell, need to say like a soprano sings higher. So it has that L shape at 55 kilohertz. And um, the Natusi's pipistrelle shell is a bit lower again and it's at 39 kilohertz. So these pipistrelles are very easy to tell apart using ultrasound. Other species can be a lot more difficult. And um, so to show you some of the other species, um, these, these bats here are just extremely rare. And um, basically the Irish panda, if you, you know, in China they have the panda and it's so rare. In Ireland, it's the lesser horseshoe bat. And it's kind of your last chance to see these animals. So uh, I would I would go and, and, and look for them wherever, wherever possible. Um, there's about 12 to 14,000 left of them, and Ireland is one of the last strongholds for them in the world. Um, we do have them in Wales and in various other places, but really Ireland is a, you know, they're very, very important place. And they live in old farm buildings. Um, now, so horses are a little peculiar. When I was young, I was very short-sighted. And I used to need to have to feel my way along things to find my, play, my way anywhere. And let's a horseshoe bat, they have a very short um, uh, uh, ultrasound. They actually, most bats shout the ultrasound through their mouths, but the lesser horseshoe shouts to its nose. And so because of this, its wavelength is very short. So it's a little like being short-sighted. They kind of have to feel their way along hedgerow. So they need, um, they, they need a roost that is kind of connected by a hedgerow to their feeding area. So they're very, very particular. And um, also they like underground systems to, to hibernate in. Um, uh, so they like limestone areas. They can also use underground systems in uh, often in old buildings. So I, I've done a traditional farm building survey that had an underground tunnel. And uh, well, we weren't in, le in a lesser horseshoe area, but it, a tunnel like that will act like a cave. Um, now, the problem with these bats is that there's a, a whole load of them in Clare in Galway, and there's a lot of them in Cork and Kerry. But there, but obviously there's quite intensive farming going on around Limerick, and a lot of the old farm buildings around there have collapsed. So there's no way for the lesser horses to meet up. They, we would hope that they would meet and breed in that area, and the two um, uh, populations would mix. But because they're, they're so fussy you have to have a hedge running to the to the place to, to the, the building and you have to have a building of a certain size and you have to have an underground chamber and and they, they also really like you know big old castle buildings so and um, the problem is that there isn't much of that in Limerick so if, if you happen to be in Limerick and you have a traditional farm building please do your best to keep it keep the roof on and uh, keep it keep it going because these bats, they aren't mating, and it's a real concern that these two populations are going to just become completely inbred. Um, so now on to the Lysler's bat, and this is a very bad picture of them, really. But um, the Lysler's bat is our biggest bat, and it 
he likes flying out in open pastures, quite the opposite to the, the lesser horseshoe. Um, and it's a very loud bass. You pick it up very easily on a bass detector. And it is, I'm finding it more and more living in um, farmers' houses. I used to live in Dublin. I used to live in Dublin in the houses all the time. And now I'm surveying in Dublin a lot. And I very, very rarely come across it. But I come across roosts all the time in um, farm, farmers' houses. Um, I don't know whether they've moved out to the country or they've just been excluded from houses. It's a real problem. Um, now, you know, well, obviously, as we're all trying to get our houses made more airtight and everything, uh, it means that there's no space in attics anymore for, uh, for wildlife when we're, we're sealing up our attics and putting in insulation. I'll just move on to the next one. Now, I bet you won't even see these. Meiosis bats, it's, it's, I always say, if you, uh, uh, if you want to get rich quick, run a course for bat workers on how to tell meiosis bats apart. There's, there's, there's whiskers, natteroos, and uh, dobentons bats, and they're just really difficult to tell apart. You can, if you get a good look at them when they're flying, it's great, but looking at them on, on sound analysis on the files on the bat detectors, very, it's very difficult to tell them apart. Um, I was actually just at one of these courses about three weeks ago, and they say even with that, with all the special sound files they do, they're, they're only 70% right in, in you know, trying to decide uh, which is which. Now, you probably can't even see this, but these are all little feet sticking out, and they like to live in cracks and crevices. Um, and the only time I get to see Nasher's Bast, I, I would survey, whatever, three nights a week from from May until September, the end of September. And the only time I see natural spots is when I'm just doing traditional farm buildings. I never see them in any other place. So I think natural spots, I think traditional farm buildings are the place where they're just hanging on there. And um, they're really very rare. Whiskered bats are also extremely rare. They have, um, they, they really like forestry. So they have to have kind of the farm building and, and forestry. And then Dobenton spats are more common. They'll roost in bridges and old churches and, uh, and that kind of thing. And actually speaking of, of churches, they always say um, that if the, the brown long bat is a Catholic bat because it likes those big Catholic church attics, they always say the Natagrove's bat is a Protestant bat because it likes, it likes that kind of square um, uh, a bit that the Protestant churches have, you know, those, those kind of square bell towers that they have. Um, but Natagrove's bat, I, I think, to me, I think they're getting rarer and rarer. They just don't cope very well with, with disturbance from people. Light pollution really affects meiosis bats as well. So how do you know if you have bats? Um, it, well, you, you might find some droppings on the ground. Now, uh, if you squish the droppings, they'll just crumble. Bats eat insects, and they can eat up to about 3,000 insects a night, even the, the pipistrelles. So we squish the, the, the droppings, it just turns into a dust. Whereas if you squish them and they don't turn into a dust, it's a mouse dropping. Other than that, they look exactly like mouse droppings. Also, you might come along and see little piles of wings, uh, butterfly wings or moth wings on the ground. Um, and this is the long-eared bat perch. It will be hanging above this. Um, a bit like when my kids were small and you gave them food they didn't like, they spat out the bits they didn't like onto the ground. And the long-eared bat does exactly the same. So it eats the middle bit, but it leaves the wings behind. And you often go into an old farm building and see little clusters of wings like that. And if you look right up, you'll see, um, during the night, you'll see a, 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 a perch. Now, obviously, the best way to see bats is to go out and look for them and use a bat detector. Um, when you go out in the evening, you see the bats, but often the bats just come out of the roost and they fly away. And it's just really difficult. It looks like the building is dripping bats. You can't tell where did the bats come from and, um, uh, you know, where do they go? And did it come from that building? You know, it's, very, it's actually very difficult to tell. But if you get up about an hour before dawn and look, the bats, before they go back into the building, they'll swirl around and around and they touch off against the building um, often of where they're going in. And that's really where you find where, where there are roosts is there and how exactly the bats are getting in and out of the roost. It's absolutely, it's like, I, I, if, if you know of a roost, go and see it. It's like one of the wonders of the world. It is just amazing to stand amongst all these swirling bats. And um, people often say to me, oh, are you tired in the morning? 
I, I am so excited in the mornings when I'm doing the bat service. It's absolutely, it's amazing seeing them. Um, and I, I, it is worth getting up early to see. So what happens if you have bats in your building? Uh, first of all, you need a derogation license from the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Um, now, there's no problem with, with this. It's, uh, we just have to let the, the wildlife rangers know what we're doing, how we're going to, how we're going to deal with the bats. Um, and if the bats are in your house, the wildlife ranger will come and do this for free. So there's no cost uh, involved in it. The main thing is that you can't take, you can't do any work on the roof um, or the area where the bats are, are living between May and August because the, the mothers have their babies and if anything disturbs them, the mothers will abandon and the, the babies will starve to death. And it's unbelievably cruel and you'll have lost then a whole year's supply of, of young, which will be a disaster. I always tell everybody to cover all water tanks in any attics to have um, because uh, bats do tend to fall into water tanks and also they shriek and other bats try and go and help them and they also fall into the water tanks and it's a it's a, it's horrible drowning for them all and um, so uh, other things that we usually ask is that to keep keep access for the bats so when you do up the building just uh, keep holes in the attic and um, keep holes so the bats can get in and out and um, this is this is Jonathan's building and we just left they have these lovely little and I there's probably some technical name for them but these little holes in his in his building and we just left them open so bats can still get in and out this is um this is a building on my farm that the wall fell down on and we pieced it up again and um, and we put a little gap here it's like a little it, it, it's a it's called a bat brick and it's like a little letterbox slit and the bats can fly in and out I have a uh, common pipistrels and brown long ears going in and out and they can still get in and out of the attic and it's fine um, and you can also tell little kids that have a very tall postman because they're asking why is a letterbox up in the roof as uh, so other things that we can do is we can put on bat slates and that allows bats to get in and out of the attic or you can just leave gaps either under the eaves or at the apex and again that that uh, will let the bats get in and out Natural crevices are very important and it's important to leave as many of these as possible, especially deep ones. Um, it's very important not to, uh, uh, when repointing, that you just, they're checked for bats first. Use a torch and a stick and just be very careful. If anybody is ever doing this and they want a lens of a fiber scope, I have a, it's like an, an endoscope thing and you can poke it down and have a good look um, and see. Often there's birds living in these crevices as well. Timber treatment, um, bats are very susceptible to poisoning from timber treatment because they often lie right up against the wood. So they'll be just ingesting that timber treatment the whole time. Um, now, I'm always hearing that, oh, there's you know, reasonably safe timber treatments. I am very afraid of timber treatments. Um, I had just over the years, I've been told, you know, oh, this, this treatment is safe. Oh, this is fine. You can use it from bats. It's fine for mammals. And then again and again, you know, five years later, you hear, oh, no, actually, it's dangerous. Actually, it's, you know, this, this is actually, it's really bad. And um, in France really leads the way in timber treatment. They rarely allow timber treatment at all. They had a, a lot of trouble with, um, with uh, children getting sick, getting poisoned in attic rooms where young kids had, actually, had kids having seizures and they broke it all down to the timber treatment. And we found in Ireland a lot of the time they would ban timber treatment and then the stuff would get dumped on the Irish market. So um, I'm living in a 200 year old house and we have woodworm in the attic and I will not let any timber treatment be done. Apparently it'll take 200 years for the beam to collapse. Um, and I would rather replace my beams every 200 years than risk uh, when our, our bedrooms are close up to the attic uh, than risk the, the, uh, the timber. But you can get safe and um, reasonably safe timber treatments and they're borax based and uh, this is what we would recommend if you're going to do it at all. If you hear a crash behind me it's probably the roof falling in. <laughs> I may have been wrong about this. And <laughs> um, bat boxes, bat boxes are, uh, I don't know, they're, they're, they're like these hubs, I mean, like people kind of say oh bat boxes they're great, we'll exclude the bats and we put up bat boxes and everything will be fine. 
um, I, I think they're like these student hubs or something. It's, it's kind of the grand little places, but certainly the mothers having the kids, they don't want to live there. They're never hot enough. So you get a few kind of, you know, bachelor pad guys living in there, but the, the women don't like it. They, you know, they, they want somewhere really cozy and warm and an attic is the place. And um, so now this is, this spot box to the left is actually very successful design. Um, the main thing about commercial bat boxes you see for sale and even plans you get for make, making bat boxes, the entrance gap have, the entrance gap is too big on nearly all the bat boxes that you see for sale. It should be about 15 to 18 millimeters and um, any more than that. And bats just, they don't feel safe in it. All the designs and all the bat boxes get are for British bats, which are bigger than the Irish ones. So it's kind of like nice, like having a big, lovely home and then no front door on it. They just feel anxious and they just, they won't use it. And um, the way 15 to 18 millimeters is about the size of your thumb. So if you see a box for sale, just put your thumb in it. And if your thumb, if, you're, if your thumb is kind of wiggling around a bit, the gap is too big. It should be just kind of feel tight against your thumb. And then you've got the right size um, uh, for, for, for bats to, to go in. This box to the right, I, we've been trying to, we have a big barn at the back and we kind of use it as our bat lab for trying out uh, whatever experiments and seeing what can we make that, that bats would live in. And we, we found when we got sick bats in that they loved lying on lizard pads. So, so we tried to, we built a, a lizard pad into a bat box and we put little gaps here. This, these are the 15 millimeter gaps. Um, and under this is a, is a lizard pad and we plugged it in and we insulated it and we tried to get the temperature up to uh, 30 degrees. Um, now, unfortunately, it hasn't worked. The females still don't think it's hot enough. I think we've been getting the temperature up to 24, 25 degrees. So it's just not hot enough. But we have three males there at the moment currently living in this stretched out lovely against the lizard pad. Um, but kind of the, you know, the, the holy grail for bat workers is to get a bat box that would be hot enough for females to roost in. There are commercially available ones that cost about six or 700 euros each, and they've worked in Scotland, but anyway, put in Ireland haven't worked. So, um, so this is really why attics are just so important. Um, yeah, as regards homes, but I was go actually going to show you one that failed, which was the one here on the left, except that it, it hadn't. Um, with Green Foundation Ireland, we, we decided, so seeing the bats love living in crevices and stonework where there's bits of wood as well. Um, and I have a barn, but it's not a lovely traditional farm building. As you can see, it's just breeze block. So we decided we'd make these kind of crevices, put them in, in boxes. We got a whole load of kids out and we got them stuffing boxes with stones, cementing them in, putting in bits of sticks and everything. And we hung them up all over the barn to try and create the traditional bar, barn building effect. Um, and I was going to tell you that it didn't work, but just I went out to take a photo of this the other day. We check all these things every night and there was a bat in it. <laughs> so it might be a bit like the brown long eared that maybe they just don't like the, the, the smell of the concrete and that. And once things settle, that, that's about three years old now that box. Um, once things settle, they'll, they'll move in. Um, this thing here was a lot more successful um, in Britain, they've been trying to build bat hibernacula and they've, um, they've built caves. They've spent, oh, thousands of euros building underground structures and caves, trying to get bats to roost in them over winter. And um, just hasn't worked. They've gotten butterflies, but it, it's really been very difficult to get right. Um, so we discovered when I was doing all these uh, traditional farm building surveys, you'd often find a bat between two joists. So in our barn, which just has a tin roof, we put, there's a real joist and we put a fake joist beside it. Again, that 15 millimeters apart. We put a little bit of bituminous felt behind us so that that wouldn't be right onto steel. And it has been just unbelievably successful. Every year we get seven or eight bats hibernating in this. Um, and it is, it's used throughout the winter for, for hibernation. It costs about a tenner. It's a very cheap and easy thing to do. Um, so one problem for bats is light pollution. Um, the rarer bats, the meiosis species and the lesser horseshoe, they really can't cope with lighting at all. It kind of blinds them. The other problem is it sucks all the insects to them. So then they're trapped in the dark. 
And so they have no food in the dark and all the insects are gone to the light and they can't get over there. And it can act almost like a physical barrier stopping them from getting to their, uh, from their home to their feeding area. Or um, and like, I just really hate to see waterways being lit up. So in the farm buildings, we all always say, don't put any lighting, just put sensor lighting on. So it's on when you need it, but not, you know, don't use the, these big harbor floodlights. I think if I was granted diplomatic immunity um, and I was allowed to cr commit whatever crime I like for a week or something, I'd buy a pellet gun and I'd smash every floodlight I ever saw. <laughs> they really are, they're just, it's just so bad for bats and, uh, and actually, you know, quite bad for people too. More and more research has been done into the effects of light pollution uh, on, on, on people. Um, so finally, don't forget the birds. Birds also use um, traditional farm buildings to, to nest in. I, I think almost every farm building I've ever come across has had um, swallows in it nesting. And uh, so it's, it's yeah, it's, 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 it's really a fantastic habitat for uh, birds, bats and, and all things, things, all kinds of wildlife. And in particular, as wildlife is being excluded now from, uh, from, from houses, as we make them all airtight. And again, as we use this, as Anna spoke about, um, this kind of white uh, um, type of kind of plastics, like a plastic underlay that you see now everywhere in houses. Bats can't chew, so uh, they get tangled up in this. It gets wrapped around their legs. They can't get out, out of it, and they just, they just die. Um, there has been some really horrible cases of this in Britain, of a whole, a loads of maternity roofs, people, bats in a maternity roofs getting tangled in it. Um, so that's why traditional farm buildings, they really are crucially important to bats and other wildlife. Thanks very much. If you have any questions, just, just chat to me afterwards or put them in the chat. Um, I'll hand you over next to, to Jonathan. I'll just uh, stop my screen sharing if I can. There we go. So, Jonathan, are, are you there? No. I'm here now. Yeah. Great. Hi. Uh, I must. I must apologize to everyone. I haven't uh, expansive slides like Donna and Anna. Um, I suppose I'm here in this this Zoom thing called tonight just to explain what, what, where where I come into it in relation to the traditional farm buildings grant uh, um, part of the glass scheme in 2020 that we participated in. Um, what we, we did ourselves was we, we carried out um, preservation work on a courtyard adjoining Cumulan House in Cumulan from Ree County Mead, um, which were late 18th century, first on the Ordnance Survey maps in the 19th century. Um, the, the repairs consisted of reslating and um, repairs of timbers and the roofs uh, and matching some of the old with the new. And uh, we tried to reuse as much as the old materials as possible. And where we couldn't salvage the old materials, we, we matched with other materials from salvage yards in the in the local in the local jurisdiction, uh, I suppose um, the the beauty of, of, of the project was it uh, the, the expertise from from the Heritage Council. Um, we learned a hell of a lot ourselves. That stuff that we didn't know that um, only the fact we we participated in the course that we we we, we would be totally oblivious to have the, the, the craftsmanship that was needed. Please excuse me, everyone. I'm not used to these Zooms, so uh, I might sound a bit blurred and a bit fast. Um, the, where, where do I start here now? The, I suppose we commenced work in the 15th of September, 2020, and we finished it uh, late October. Um, Primarily because we 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 carried out Donna carried out the bat survey in the middle of May, and obviously we couldn't carry out any works because we had four species of bats. We had the Lesler bat, the Natter bat, and Soprano pipistrelle bat, and the common pipistrelle, 
all of which I didn't have a clue that we had. Um, so uh, here's me being a typical farmer, I want to bull on and get the job done. But uh, we, we had to persevere and be patient and let the wildlife take its course. So um, one thing I'd say about the scheme with the bat survey, which was, was critical to do, it leaves the time frame in, in the back end of the year from you, with the elements of weather and stuff, it's, uh, it can be challenging, you know, to, to complete the, the work. Um, particularly in the last few seasons, we've had the, the winter seems to be closing in quicker and uh, with roofs exposed, uh, you, you know, you, you'd, li you'd like to get them sealed up and protected from the elements as quick as possible. Um, ourselves, we, we engaged uh, a, a local conservation officer, which was, was useful for us to oversee the project. And we engaged a builder from County Monaghan and um, that was word of mouth from a colleague that was in a discussion group on one of our farming uh, part of the, the BTAP group, uh, which is a, to do with bee farming. Um, so basically, it was word of mouth of the, the, the craftsmanship uh, of the builder that was suited to the job, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, I suppose before we, we engaged the builder, we went and looked at a, a few particular projects that he did, and we were extremely happy that he took a lot of pride in his work, and uh, it, it wasn't just like a, a case of, uh, you know, slap it up and get it done. Um, he, he had a, a, a lot of uh, experience in this area of conservation, and I suppose the, 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 key, the key message is, is it was... Um, to me was it's not a restoration project it's a it's a preservation project and i suppose the the fact that these buildings were adjoining the main the, our main house that uh, we know we didn't want to be looking out the window every year and seeing more slate slip and fall on the ground and you know going into disrepair so it it, it, was, it was great that we could um get get the work carried out with the help of the heritage council that uh, they're protected for future generations. Um, now, as, as, as much as people like might want to think that you can turn the buildings into a commercial enterprise, I think it's, uh, you know, that's for an, an, another generation to, to look at or maybe down the road, but it's a five-year window where you, you, you don't want to part the glass scheme. The, the, it's... The, Surely for farm use, of, of which we use them as a, a farm store and a workshop store, a small workshop. Um, it's hard. It's hard when there's, uh, there's there's no feedback on the on the 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 call. But uh, if there's any questions, please yeah uh, ask. But um, there's if anyone wants to look on the the net on there's a an app that's farming app. There's a a commentary and some pictures of, of our, our buildings on, on that. Thank you very much. John. Sorry, Claire. No, no, that's great. Did you, oh God, just sorry, my fire alarm's going off. It's okay. Everything's fine. <laughs> Timing. Um, yeah, Jonathan, Jonathan submitted a book <laughs> with making his application. <laughs> <laughs> the Cullen <Am> Jubilee. <laughs> this is quite something. And there's also the remains of a Norman castle within the within the farmyard, you know. It's and one of the things about that I know that when we when the application came in was what you saw from the photographs was just this really the sense of just being very well valued, really well cared for. You know, you just got that sense from the photographs in terms of all of the buildings and that 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 sense of value uh, would, you know, matters a lot because you just hope after repairs have been carried out that, you know, the nature of the buildings are that it doesn't stop when, you know, this process of repairs are done. You know, a few years from now or a few years after that, again, you just, you know, you might have to take away at a few other things. So 
So it's just, um, it gave us a lot of confidence in offering a grant here. I know because of, there was just sense of a value of the buildings, you know, and it was a very tricky part because you remember that curved section, Jonathan, where yes. Sean had worked on and the bodies had collapsed and that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tricky thing to do. And it was, it was really, really well done. A lot of care taken there, I think, yeah. by your builder, you know, lovely. No, it was very good. And it was great to get it done. Um, it was well worth the, the paper, the paperwork and <laughs> various inspections and the likes, but uh, we're happy now. We're, it's, it's a shame I didn't have pictures for, for the call, but um, as I said, they're on, the, that's farming link. So if people want to view them, they can see it there. Jonathan, I wondered just, could you share that? Is it a link um, in the chat or um, maybe we can share it afterwards just so- I Yeah, I, I, I'll share it, see if we can. Um, click on the chat button and, and pop the link in there. I think everyone would be interested. Yeah, okay. In, in following that. Um, we have about 20, 25 minutes for questions. And there's quite- Can I just say something as well? Sorry, just in response to Donna and the bats. The building behind me, is our HQ the, in Kilkenny, where the Heritage Council is based. We own one other building, and it's a stables in Dromore County Clare, which we bought a long time ago. And the reason why we bought it is because that it is a fantastic roost for lesser horseshoe bats. It's a there's somewhere like in the region of 350 bats there. It's internationally, it's of international importance. And because of the level of concern for these bats so it is the one it is the one other building that we own and um they're i must say they're doing very well in it we've got a report there recently which is really good so. fantastic sorry no, that's that's great yeah um I, I remember I remember the absolute panic when we realized that building all the bat people realized that building was up for sale and we you know, we nearly died because that is just one of the most important places left. Um, and we were kind of, who can we get to buy it? Who? And we'd actually persuaded a millionaire, uh, Vincent Weir, to buy a load of buildings. And he had kind of said, enough is enough here now. <laughs> yeah, but he had bought actually, well, he didn't buy, he, he uh, removed lots of buildings and he bought one or two. And we're, what are we going to do? So we were just so glad the Heritage Council stepped in and bought that because we would have lost it and we would have lost that roost. Uh, it just, it is, as you say, critically important. Yeah. Well, so we ought to go to the questions. <laughs> Sorry, Claire. <laughs> there are actually quite a lot of questions going through. So <laughs> um, I'm actually just gonna stop recording um, so that we don't uh, accidentally capture any of the, um, um, any of the participants in the recording just for GDPR reasons. So, um, I'll just do that now and, and